Wonderful. Great. Well, welcome to everybody. Here we are in the webinar Q&A. It's an informal space and platform that I have sent out invitations to my fellow entrepreneurs and um, people are expressing interest in this phenomenal thing called the four day work week. And I'm so excited to get into the conversation and the questions that are gonna come up. Karen, if I could ask you to go to the next slide. Um, it's, it's a small room, so we can certainly keep this casual and informal and there's gonna be great opportunities for engaging, um, I really just want to kick off by talking about what the role of the entrepreneur does and, and what my interest was with this movement. And I mean, this quote, the people who think they're crazy enough that who can change the world are the ones that do it, really resonates because as entrepreneurs, we're at the forefront of um, change and innovation. And we're always looking into the future to see and uh, really look at better ways of creating and doing. And that's exciting. That's exciting for me and it's exciting that you're all here. Um, I'm gonna get straight into just talking about who's in the team. Um, if I could ask for everybody, please to just put your mics on mute until we get to the Q&A, that would be super great. And um, We'll start off. So I'm Licia. Some of you know me, some of you don't. My name is Licia. I'm a career strategist. I've been an entrepreneur and I've been um, running my career strategy business for the past 10 years. My perspective and intersection with the four day work week really comes from the fact that when I hit friction in my career, there was no option of a four day work week. It was either full on work or step out into something on your own. And I continue to work with emerging leaders and established leaders who represent organization externally um, and, and look quite successful, but on the inside, they're working with me and many of all of us and entrepreneurs in this room, feeling dissatisfied and disenfranchised with the way in which we are all working. And um, that's my interest and that's my involvement. And that's why I'm here. I think we all acknowledge that something has to shift and something has to change. We're on a trajectory to um, increasing and burnout and more and more workplaces are reporting the fallout and the effect of what this uh, problem and uh, issue is continuing to, to raise and create. So if we could just keep going, Karen, on, on to the next slide, that would be great. So the four day work week, really is a coalition. This is an opportunity to an experiment in South Africa and um, form part of the pilot, which is the excitement of what's going to happen within this shift of the way in which we work. Um, we're all advocates for change. We're putting our hands up for that. It's run as the coalition as a nonprofit company and we're looking for pilot participants. Karen, if you could go to the next slide, thank you. So there's four key areas within the South African coalition. There's the business coalition represented by a number of different organizations and businesses. There's the entrepreneurs coalition that I've um, enjoyed spearheading for now. There's the youth coalition and then there's the government coalition. Within each of these coalitions, there's opportunities to play a role as a strategic council, as a contributing member, as a pilot participant, and as a referral partner or part and, part and parcel of recruiting pilot participants. And I'm very available to flesh through all of those roles in, in more detail with all of you. So we really are excited about this being a movement within South Africa that connects with the global movement. And there's, it's, it's a pact and it's a form of co-creation. There's room for us all to play a role here and there's room for us all to move forward with this exciting um, solution and option. These are the people that are part of the Entrepreneurial Coalition. They're in the room today. And this is just a slide that gives you an indication of who's who. We also then have our anchor partners, um, the Stellenbosch Business School, who are playing a very 
strategic role from a research perspective and a number of businesses who are part of the broader South African coalition. And then we have contributive partners. And this is what's the starters. These slides are going to continue to grow because the um, launch in South Africa has been phenomenal. And the interest and the uptake of what the four day work week means and what the possibility is for South Africa continues to just resonate and grow. I'd like to get into introducing specifically the team. So Karen Lowe is the chairperson and chairwoman and uh, founding member of the organization, the, the South African MPO. She's known as an intrepid leader. She's also the managing director of Go Forward, a communications consultancy. Her role right now is the orchestrator of this phenomenal four day work week movement in PO and how it's continuing to grow and span across the country with great opportunity. Um, I've just lost my vision of the slides. Sorry. Mkondise um, Gomedi better known as MQ, is our co-chairperson working alongside Karen. He comes from a technical advisory and um, strategy and analytic background. Um, his work and perspective, both from a digital techn technological experience, as well as from an operational perspective, operational experience perspective is unique. Um, and he really looks at catalyzing the technical with humanities be able to provide on uncommon results. Next up is Keisha Saraje, who is our um, Growing Our Youth Coalition. She's a strategy director with Global Talent. They're a think tank focused on understanding and influencing the future of work and education. She specifically is responsible for the growth of the organization through innovative and thoughtful strategic solutions attending to complex talent management challenges. And Keisha's doing some phenomenal work in engaging with the South African Youth Coalition. We also have a number of partners that are joining as we speak. Zambini Pfeffer is joining, um, walking alongside of me in the Entrepreneurs Coalition. Zambini is a lecturer um, at UCT in the Work-Life Balance Program. And she's using her own lived experience of corporate burnout in terms of how to design and facilitate that particular program. In terms of media and exposure and socials, there's been a phenomenal amount of um, reach. Some of you might, well, you're all here because you, you know me, but some of you might be here because you've also seen the outreach and, and the phenomenal um, landscape that that uh, all media outlets have um, profiled. The slide probably needs to be updated because I think it was over 4 million rands worth of media coverage, which has exploded the interest within the four day week. Um, and without any further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Karen, who's um, orchestrating behind the scenes in more ways than one because she here is driving the slides for me. So Karen, over to you to really just give us an overview and talk about the pilot and um, take us through what was a two hour introduction at the launch into a 10 minute, this is what the four day work week campaign is about. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Lisa, and a warm welcome to everyone. Thanks really for giving up your Friday lunchtime to, to join us today. It certainly has been um, uh, uh, certainly not a four day week uh, for me for the last uh, three, four months. Um, it, it's been more like a seven day, 24 seven week, um, but it's been an incredibly rewarding time. And uh, we've come a long way in a very short space of time. I, I, I knew South Africa would be interested. I wasn't quite expecting them to be quite so interested. And we've been scrambling to catch up getting uh, CRM systems in place and email platforms and so on and so forth. So I'm incredibly thankful to all of our contributing partners that really have put their hands up and volunteered their, their time, their resources, their skills, et cetera. So 
Rini, my job today, and I'm trying to make sure I'm not I'm not not admitting anyone. So if anyone hears a ding dong and I don't hear it, please alert me to the fact that I might be missing someone in my waiting room. All right, so I'd like to just set some context. Um, and I'm going to just use a few statements to do that. And you'll all get a copy of the PDF so that you can read further. And I'm pretty sure that you guys are aware of a lot of these reports. But from, from an entrepreneur perspective, you know, SMEs are the lifeblood of South Africa's economy and also the most at risk. And, and if you read McKinsey's uh, sort of, uh, Middle East and Africa report, you know, they, they really are speaking to the sector of the economy and looking to the sector of the economy, not just to uh, mitigate the risk that they're facing, but to harness the potential and the power and the economic power within the sector. And, and, and we don't stack up particularly well when we look uh, to, to, to global markets, but we do know that we're a vital component of economies creating jobs and enabling inclusive growth. And I think for, 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 for Alicia and myself and a lot of others within the coalition, we share the sentiment that the pioneer pilot that's coming up, we really are targeting and focusing on this sort of sector of the economy. We know that the bigger guys are going to take a little bit longer to come on board, are facing, you know, more rigorous change management requirements in order to get them into a pilot uh, situation. But the SME sector really needs to be harnessed and, 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 and supported. The next, and I, I you know what, I, I'm, I'm exhausted by all the quiet quitting and productivity paranoia and all of the terminology that's out there, but it certainly does pick up on a, on, on a key thread and it's, it's very evident. There's a, there's a very real trust deficit that's currently out there between employer and employee. And having one of the most prolonged lockdowns, our return to work and sort of settling into the hybrid work environment with the flexibility component has not been that easy for South Africa. And certainly, you know, we have more, we have conditioned behavior, more conditioned because of the prolonged period of the lockdown. But productivity paranoia is a, is a very real thing. And, you know, you can see this disconnect between how employees report that they're productive at work and how leaders have confidence in, um, you know, and whether their team is being productive. So ultimately, you know, what, what we're seeing is, is organizations, big and small, actually, but your larger organization is like, if there's not a bum on a seat, it's not productive. And this mandated call back to work is creating a lot of friction within the work environment. And I think this is one of the first things that I encountered when I initially started exploring the four-day week was, was, you know, my clients were saying, you know, I'm really struggling to get the Gen Zs back to work. They don't want to come back. We're losing staff. You know, what do we can do? What can we do about that? And then in amongst it is I need to see them because I need to, I need to know they're working. And I was like, well, how do you look at productivity by attaching a person to a bum on seat? It's, it, it's a ridiculous, um, you know, your idea that, that someone is productive because they're sitting in a chair. I can tell you exactly how productive I was when I was younger. And first in corporate, I was playing solitaire first thing in the morning with my computer screen facing me, not the door. And just because I happened to get there before the buses and leave after them, I was present. Was I productive? No, not all of the time. That's for sure. And the employees are really driving a hard bargain on flexibility, especially the younger, the younger, um, the younger market. And, um, you know, flexibility is becoming a currency. It is globally. And it is a currency to retain and attract talent. We know that that talent acquisition um, vertical is a very, very important component. And, and even particularly for some industries, you know, within fintech we're, we're, and, and others, we're losing talent. South Africa is losing talent. I mean, there was a report out um, uh, earlier this week that said 68% of graduates want to leave South Africa. That's frightening. 68% want to leave. It's just, we've got to create an environment that, that, that you know, it encourages them to stay within the workforce. I'm not going to, I'm going to leave the, you guys to go through all of these slides. I've, I've added a lot of detail for you, but I just want to point out social connection is, is definitely worth the commute. There is value in the hybrid environment. I don't think South Africa has got it right yet. And I think we're going to continue to grapple with it until we experiment with what could be the future of work in South Africa. So I'm not saying that the four day week might be here for the next 20 years. 
I think what we're trying to do is experiment with South Africa, have a conversation around productivity, move us from an obsession towards time, from a time-based conversation to a productivity and output output based conversation um, and it's important to support this return to work and hybrid environment to get to optimal flexible working environments for different industries for different teams for different individuals if people can't learn they'll leave and this for me says it all i i, I look at that gen z they want those skills they want to learn they want to grow organizations that go on the four-day week and and have piloted have found that their 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 employees have time to upskill themselves within the days off and that can be one of the areas that we can really champion within south africa in terms of getting our heads around um uplifting our 7.7 .7 million unemployed youth that we're currently experiencing in south africa this is this is shocking we have one of the world's lowest mental health scores as a component of well-being so gallup's finding just from an engagement perspective, our stress levels, our worry, our anger, our sadness, it, it, it's, it's an issue. It's a great report if you haven't read it, the State of the Global Workplace from Gallup. But South Africa really is, is one of the most depressed and least engaged countries globally. And again, I feel that there's a need to address this, and I feel that the four-day week could. And this is Charlotte Lockhart, one of the co-founders of, of, um, of the four-day week global she always says this. She says, we borrow our people from their lives. We borrow our people from their lives. And this is such a powerful statement. So the challenge really that I'm measuring South Africa is how do we borrow our people from their lives better? And it's really critically important that we do that. We, we don't own them. We, 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 we exchange value. And, and, and we need to move away from the obsession of time and understand that flexibility and what staff and employees are doing with their flexibility has direct benefit to both the employer and the employee. Just a quick background. This was founded in 2017 by Andrew Barnes, who owns a CEO of Perpetual Guardian. And he started this entire thing with a trial within his own organization. And the results were astounding. And I'd like to just pause here for one minute. For those of you that aren't familiar, and I'm sure most of you are, this is the most critical component of the four-day week. And there are a lot of misconceptions out there that the four-day week means a Friday off. It does not. It is not a day off. That is not what the, the principle is. It's 100% pay for 80% of time as long as we get a commitment and an exchange of 100% output. So individuals will stay within the employment environment with a pact entered into with their employer that says, I will remain on 100% pay. I, I will, however, reduce my working week from 40 to 32 hours but I'm going to ensure that I maintain or improve my productivity during that process. Um, and I'm hopefully that was, that was clear enough. I'm going to rush through some of these. So why the pilot? And, and you, you guys can read all of this, but that's also another word that South Africa seems to have a little bit of an issue understanding. A pilot is an experiment. That is what we're doing. We are, we are, we are trialing um, with a global framework and structure behind us. And the whole idea of this is to test, learn, fail, test, learn, improve, and move the, move, the, move, the, move the needle. And essentially, productivity is at the heart of this experiment. But the happy accident of the, of the global trials, all of them, have been an improvement, a stock, a marked improvement in employee engagement, well-being, um, company cultures, et cetera. So the well-being component of the global pilots has been incredible. So we're starting to see the social proof coming through um, with findings coming out, especially for the UK. So currently the 2022 pilots are Ireland, US, Canada, UK is the biggest. Um, and I, we've got lots of resources on, on, on mid-mark findings for, for UK. Um, we're already, you know, they're already writing bills into Parliament. Um, it, it's, it's quite astonishing how, um, you know, 3,300 employees have managed to create such an impact with this, with this pilot. But we are joining and onboarding at the same time as the EU, uh, EU uh, program. But there's Valencia, Portugal, Germany, Brazil, <clears throat> Australia, uh, Japan, Israel and Russia have not been added to this list, but they are also um, in discussions. So there is a wider social impact with this pilot. Uh, it looks around workplace environment, personal 
components and community components. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I need to hand back over to the rest of my team and you guys can go and read this, but there are significant health benefits. So if you look at absenteeism and presenteeism, this is where the time off component comes in and produces an upswell in well-being and the health benefits and the cost of, of the, you know, the, the risks of stress and mental health and the costs of dealing with that and absenteeism is, 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 is remarkable. The environmental benefits, not, not going into work, not driving, reducing the carbon footprint. This was a study done by Henley Business School. And, and it, it could be significantly uh, larger uh, carbon footprints if we were all going back to work at the same time and driving the same distances, et cetera. Um, and then really, this is the warm and fuzzy, but you're starting to see time for cooking, shopping, fitness, study, entertainment, improving work skills, eating out, this one I love, volunteering, being able to take care of aging parents, etc. cetera. Um, and here is another very exciting statistic coming through. 23% would take up a side hustle or set up their own business. So you imagine if you're employed and you are an entrepreneur, imagine how many of those that could bring in and employ or at very least upskill graduates in the in, in the workplace. What am I doing for time? Um, so we're right in the middle of recruiting here. We have been sort of behind the scenes for the last uh, three months. We've been in front of the scenes for the last three weeks. And November marks the moment where we really start onboarding, preparing, uh, establishing baseline metrics. And then in January, at the end of January, we start the launch of an official six month trial in South Africa. Midway through, so you've got uh, February, March, April. In May, the second pilot in South Africa will launch and start the six month program. So we will essentially have two pilots running uh, uh, along, alongside each other. So the research questions are around productivity and product profitability, workplace well-being and burnout, employee well-being and life satisfaction, gender distribution of household labor, and environmental impact. In addition to this, we are working, or Boston, uh, Boston College is working alongside Stellenbosch Business School, who I brought on as a coalition partner right from the start, because we need to understand what the nuances of the South African workplace are. And, and we need to layer on additional research parameters to ensure that we are tracking other social compacts or other social environments that we potentially could impact. So gender inequality, uh, youth skills development and upliftment, perhaps, um, you know, we can turn the dial on 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 employment, although the jury's out on that if you speak to economists, but I'm all I'm all for trialing and testing. Uh, we've spoken about that. So what is the pioneer pilot? It really is South Africa's opportunities for the thought leaders and the early adopters to get on board and come along for the ride and experiment and understand the, the impact that if you switch to a four day week, what that impact could be on your, on your business. You have access to a global and unparalleled network. Um, obviously we've got access to all of the, all of the pilot participants and, and there is workshops, mentoring, networking, and research. And there's a mid-mark feedback, but there's ongoing collection and collation of data as a, as a continuous part of, um, uh, you know, of the process. And we're obviously working uh, alongside other think tanks like Autonomy, et cetera, that are running the UK trial. Um, and we have a huge bedrock of coalition partners that are here to help with change management, with onboarding, with, with, with managing all of that. There is a donation structure directly attached to this. This has not uh, been made public to anyone other than those that have inquired direct, directly about the pilot. And I think it's time that this information starts to get out into the environment. Um, we have negotiated a RAND-based, fixed RAND-based price, um, which sort of scales from micro organizations to large organizations, but the fee is based on the number of employees participating in the trial. So you could have a large organization like a ShopRite or a Capitec or a Discovery Bank that has, you know, in excess of 4,000, 5,000 employees, but they might choose to pilot with 250 or they might choose to pilot with 500 and cross department. So for me, the ask really within the entrepreneurial and space is this micro, small, low, small, high, medium, low is a real sweet spot for me 
for the pioneer pilot. And this is where we should be recruiting. This is where we should be targeting. We don't have boards and exco's to convince here necessarily. Um, we do have mindsets to change sometimes, but we don't necessarily have to convince boards. So this is a once-off fee for participation and all of the support and networking that goes um, into, the, into the pilot. There is an FAQ section which has specifically been written with South Africa in mind on the website, and you'll receive the PDF document afterwards. Um, this section is hyperlinked to the, to the FAQs on the website, and I'm sure there'll be more questions afterwards. And that really is, is where I'd like to hand back to you, Alicia, and um, you guys can take it from here. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for that super speedy, fast, unbelievably, unbelievably impassioned overview. I think what's clear to everyone here is that as co-creators of finding a better solution in South Africa, leaning into something that's going to work better, it's ignited our hearts and minds and our passion. You know, we're, we're kind of cracking open into this and we're all talking really fast because of the potential and the excitement. It's a long-term game in terms of shifting the narrative for South Africa, but we're, we're working with some deadlines now that we want to be able to spread the message and get people on board in the pilot. So thank you so much for that, Karen. Um, MQ, I'm handing over to you um, for you to share some of your tempered and <laughs> um, fabulous thought leadership. So thank you, MQ. Please um, take the stage. And then we're going to hit into some open floor questions and discussions. Thanks, MQ. Yeah. Well, thanks, Lisa. I'm not sure if I can um, promise tempered views, but um, I will share some thoughts. I think um, one of the things that has been striking for me as part of um, the four day week activities, which um, I've been part of now for um, the front facing time is that there seems to be um, a number of hesitations around this idea of productivity. And it's one of the things that I think have been the biggest um, kind of mindset challenges around um, the conversation that we're having. The idea that productivity does in fact grow that it grows in the back of experimentation, like Karen mentioned, and also a whole bunch of decisions that entrepreneurs are most apt to make, like Licia was mentioning. So I think it was one of the things that was most striking is that in some, to some degree, the mindset change that's required is to also to be able to convince people that productivity is something that can grow and explode. Because if it is something that can be grown, then we don't have to fear about the fact that um, productivity will drop and also don't have to fear all of the things that many of the pessimists might have to say. Um, if productivity stays at 100%, I don't see any reason to fear things like job losses or anything else. Um, I think it's worth saying that there wouldn't be a pilot that continues to cascade around the world if the experience of businesses was the fact that um, they tried a four-day week and productivity then dropped. I think um, almost all the businesses um, um, let us know that productivity at least stays where it is. And some of them even um, um, report some growth, but I thought it was an important thing just to um, re-emphasize. And I think that as we go into conversations with more people, that might be something to, um, to bear in mind. I think also one of the things around the period of time that we've come into from the pandemic and you know um, a land war in Europe and growing inflation and oil prices and all of those types of things. This is one of those amazing things in the sense that it is attainable. Um, for the cost of a change of mind, for being open-minded, one of the things that you can get is this not only productivity gain, but also all of the benefits that um, Karen alluded to earlier as she went through the slides. And so it's not that this will be effort free. It's not that it's a magic tonic. It's not a panacea for all things. But my goodness, in a time where businesses have been strained, you know, from a cash point of view, the ability to have something as close as our noses to our face in order to affect all the metrics that we're trying to move forward, I thought was a really exciting possibility. And I thought that it was one of the things that um, has most interested me in this entire process. I think also the idea of four day week or some reduced time has always been available. And I know that a lot of companies have thought about it and perhaps discussed it, but the ability to do it in a community where there's the levels of rigor that, you know, participation as pilot um, provides. So things like 
um, the multiple universities, you know, both the official universities that are part of the program and the ones that also take an interest and look at it academically from outside of the program is incredibly useful. So I know the Oxford University is involved, Cambridge University is involved with the global team. I also know that um, Henley um, University, which is not part of um, any formal um, coalition, has also done a study. Um, University of Stellenbosch, of course, does the South African and local nuance, which is very um, exciting for us. And so one of the things that you find is that there's a level of academic rigor, a level of academic safety that is available. So that's one of the reasons why doing it in this community would be useful. Obviously, the global team has got experiences in many different countries. So there's a lot of bested IP that comes from a, you know, a diversity of places. And um, we find that we can start going, well, a manufacturer in the UK perhaps participate in the program. Could that conversation help a manufacturer in South Africa? And so we go. As a global community, the resources abound and compound. And I think that that's really useful. And then the other thing, of course, is that there are opportunities for the entrepreneurial and pioneering amongst us to also provide new IP to this uh, particular global community. And I think that that's a really exciting thing. I don't think anybody will mandate what productivity is. I, I don't think anyone will give you a magic formula, but you have a lot of people who are interested in it, who will help walk through, talk through, and be on the journey with businesses that are trying to ensure that this productivity conversation is the one that leads business. So I think for all of those reasons, it's a fantastic community to be a part of. And I think now is an incredible time because um, the reset mindset from COVID and um, other factors means that people are as open now as they will be. And then finally, I thought that there are two things that are worth repeating. And the one is that I think that an incentive that is available to business in the form of a full day off is a really meaningful thing that businesses have at their disposal, but I think they've underestimated consistently. And I think what that does, that it unleashes a broad-based ingenuity, you know, with a, a really meaningful incentive, everyone in the organization becomes somebody who's now focused on productivity. And while a lot of productive people have read books and have done courses and have attended seminars for their own personal productivity, there are very few activities that harvest that across the entire breadth of teams, departments, divisions, and companies, and all that latent potential sits there ready to be harvested. And I think that's where many of the gains come from. And um, I think that what it also does is that it puts employees and employers in the same ship. Uh, that trust deficit that um, Karen was referencing earlier, I think that when everyone, including um, uh, management and including um, employees, are all in a four-day week and all agree in this pact, in this uh, you know kind of shaking of hands to keep productivity at a certain level, there is an incredible um, unleashing of broad-based ingenuity and also feeling of being on, in the same boat that um, brings about all the benefits that we see. So I thought that that would be a useful um, kind of view from, from my vantage point. And I hope that some of it has been at least useful. And um, I hope that um, as we kind of consider the way forward with the four day work week, that um, we'll bear those things in mind and make sure that the, what's attainable is something that we use and we take forward to make work life more rewarding and make it into a better experience for everybody. Thank so you. If that is tempered and you're happy with that, I'm happy to hand back to you. <laughs> Thank you, MQ. Tempered and um, beautifully, beautifully set out. Um, I want to just pick up on the one thing that you said that Karen had also said regarding that trust deficit. Um, and in a conversation that I've had with three people within my client community who are interested in the pilot, one comes from a manufacturing background, one was in, the, in a knowledge-based industry, and the third is in um, an innovative startup environment. And they all said, so this is an opportunity for us to trial and pilot, 
gain in you know insight advice and so forth and and form part of what is groundbreaking in south africa we're also going to get some big talent hr street cred for this but it gives us the opportunity to clearly look at talent and we're also going to be able to have a six month kind of team build in a way in a sense that's what it's going to be because the people in the organization that come get put forward to the pilot really are going to be trying and building and that you know trust exercising with each other throughout that six months and on the other side of that nobody in any of the pilot regions has reported a loss of customers a loss of turnover or a loss of productivity so it was really interesting hearing in my conversations with these organizations what they were feeding back so there's this trust deficit is massive and yes you're going to be ticking many other boxes and there is also going to be um you know as, as we've spoken about many other benefits that that come through but the trust de deficit cannot be under um over emphasized thank you so much mq i'm going to just open the floor to questions but uh, so many people have asked me these and, and I'd like to just put it, this out first and then we can go into whatever individual questions come up. Can it really work in South Africa, given the challenges that we face, load shedding, unemployment, huge youth unemployment and our unique geography? Um, great that it's happening in first world pilots that aren't us. So Karen. MQ, what are your thoughts on that? This, com this question comes up often for me. MQ, why don't you give it a stab first and I'll segue off your comments. Sure, so Lisa, this has been a surprising question for me. And um, I've spent as much time as I can studying this question. I mean, first, let's give it its due. Um, it's, I mean, it's wise to consider in which way South Africa is like no other country like some other countries and then like every other country. And um, if you look at that very useful analytical lens and you look at what factors in South Africa might exclude it from working here, I can't find any. And um, what it does do is that it does reinforce the idea that um, we in fact have got a whole range of things that we have to benefit perhaps even more than the first world countries. If I might give you a, um, a suggestion, for example, that um, CNN put out a clip on the UK um, pilot and they said, well, you know, this is fantastic, but we don't know where to find more workers. And um, well, we've got the um, problem on the opposite end of the scale, where we have an oversupply of people who are willing and able to work but can't find work. So um, trying to find any reason why geographically, why economically, while from any other structural input and um, given that I spend a lot of my time in that type of analysis, I can say with a fair amount of um, conviction that there is nothing that would stop this working in South Africa. After all, South Africa is very well integrated into the global community. And there are lots of things that happen here by virtue of just say multinationals that we can see, you know what I mean? So um, if you look around us, every product is integrated. The screens we're using are all um, either from South Korea or from the US, depending on whether you're Samsung or Apple. Um, we drove here in cars not manufactured in South Africa. All of these types of, you know, kind of global phenomena, you know what I mean, which constitute productive use of economic time are available in our hands, in our motor vehicles, in our homes, and they are proof positive that there is nothing about South Africanness and South Africanisms that excludes us from participating in the global economy. Uh, uh, maybe one last thing to say is that, you know, um, all of these products, be they German or whatever they may be, are also manufactured in South Africa along the same principles that um, are um, set forth in Wolfsburg in the case of VW, in Munich in the case of BMW, you can go to a South African manufacturing operation and see those principles providing value, providing um, a living for everybody in this country. So I don't think that there is any credence to the 
fear or anxiety about it not working because it's South African. Mm, wonderful, thank you. You know, it makes me think of the fact that one, there's a South African every corner of the world too, when we talk about the connection and globalization and our reputation precedes us as our South African is, is seen as that hard work ethic that will get things done. <laughs> so kind of, surely we can do it better than maybe than from the rest of the world on the other uptick of that. Another question very quickly that often comes up that I um, enjoy responding and answering, but I want to put it to the floor is how it you know, how's it going to work across industry? Um, you can you can easily track and measure productivity in manufacturing, in, in trade? How can you track and measure productivity in a knowledge-based environment? There is this uh, uh, um, concept that, well, a four-day work week works with people sitting in an office and behind a Mac. <laughs> they can take, you know, the, the, the analogy of tech Friday off, it's not that. So within a shift-based environment, be that manufacturing, be that anywhere, they're shift-based already. The manufacturing organizations were the ones during the Industrial Revolution that shifted our concept of productivity and time continuum as it is. So why could they not continue to shift that? Um, essential services is shift-based. Restauranting, retailing is shift-based. They have a head office with knowledge workers and then they're shift-facing. So I, I keep going, I'm, I'm looking for the industry that where it might not work. And I've not yet found it, but Karen, I'd, I'd like you to weigh in on that in terms of across industry. Is it only a certain type of company in South Africa that could, this can benefit? No, not at all, Alicia. I, I think I think we've we've seen success across a multitude of of industries globally. There are obviously some lower hanging fruits and 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 organisations that are, you know, have 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 more. Uh, refined productivity and output metrics in place. But at the end of the day, you know, that this is about flipping the conversation into a productivity conversation as opposed to uh, utilizing time conversation. And I think, I think if we can get South Africa to move away from time to a conversation around outputs, in the absence of KPI, KPIs or, or, or productivity metrics being in place in any organization, there is a there is a there is an ability to harness the power of the team to determine and co-create what those what productivity looks like. And I think, you know, I think from industry to industry, sector to sector, team to team, individual to individual, this all looks, you know, very, very, very different. But there is nothing again that precludes or excludes, should I say, uh, any industry sector from from participating. And there will be a case study um, or a peer within the global pilot that will be able to share some learnings um, and, and this good starting points and, and, and what to avoid and, and, and what to do. And, you, you know, I mean, even the environments like call centers where your, your outputs and metrics, so productivity metrics are incredibly mature. They, they you know, everybody, every second of, of, of the call center is accounted for, whether it's inbound, outbound, or sometimes even on a 24 seven basis. You know, the idea is to take the concept of the applied time off and make it work within that organization's sort of productivity metrics. So, so, so for a call center that needs to be always on 24 seven, you have X number of uh, individuals working within that call center that need to provide services to whether it's, you know, whether it's a crisis or emergency center or a, whatever that center is doing. And it is a responsibility of the team first before the leadership to determine what they are producing, what those SLAs are, what the outputs are, what the KPIs are, what are the client expectations and so on and so forth. And then as a team to determine how they are going to maintain and, and or exceed the current productivity and accommodating that time off. And I think that's where the time off comes to play is every industry will interpret that differently. For some, it might be rolling weekdays off. So we might have uh, 10 people taking a Friday and then the next week they take the Monday and then you know the next bunch of people will move on onto the Friday um, it could be within if you've got a lot of working moms in your environment it could be uh, finishing earlier every day if you need to be always available on a Friday uh, you know you need and, you, and, and after our staff you just jig and rotate that time off so that every individual within the team has a reduction in the hours in their working week from 40 to 32. So this is not about a day off. And I think that's a really, really important uh, point that everybody understands. That day off translates to hours off and time off 
in return for the productivity. And the team needs to um, needs to build that together. And obviously with assistance from global. So categorically, no, there is nothing that excludes any organization. It just might be harder for some to understand and start the baseline metrics for, for productivity. And that's why we've got this coalition and that's why we've got the global framework to give us exactly the answers to those questions. I hope that answered your question. Fantastic, would, thank you. MQ, you had something to add there. I would say that for the businesses that feel that they are most um, in the dark about what productivity constitutes in their environment, they feel strongly that their environment is unique in the sense that they're the only industry that cannot reduce the activities into some kind of productive measure. I would venture to say that it might be a competitive advantage for those businesses to get into the coalition, to start having that conversation, to do it in um, a broadly productivity focused ecosystem. And if they find it, they'll be able to um, then manipulate it, they'll be able to uh, change a whole range of things around the concept of output as opposed to the concept of a finite input like time. So I would almost say that, you know, those that are in the dark productivity wise should be, I would say, the, the participants that should be most apt and most um, stand to benefit most from um, joining the pilot program. Thank you, MQ, yes. To the floor, any questions, anything at all? Leanne, have your hand up, go ahead. Unmute, please. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, everyone. And I'm so happy to see this initiative take off because it's something that I work with every day in terms of productivity um, coaching and I work with women who burn out. So that's my kind of thing in life. And I've been witnessing this hustle culture um, for years. And I, I was part of the hustle culture, which basically lent, went um, and contributed to my own burnout. But the point is, I want to make, um, I think the initiative is incredible. I want to understand how the education around productivity will work within organizations, both at a manage, manage, or managerial and executive level, and at a kind of worker base and kind of middle management level, because I think we all have different ideas of what productivity constitutes. And maybe it's a conversation that needs to be happening around much more healthier ways of product of being productive. I think if we can align on one what a, a healthy definition of productivity is, I think we'll 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 get closer to um to kind of getting or diminishing that kind of hustle mentality. Um I am worried that you've got uh, less time to do more work in and if that's not addressed at in terms of who is who is um giving out the work or or managing that kind of uh, team if they are not understanding that um or not understanding really real and um what productivity you know how it could be properly measured and, and worked on i just i'm worried about that so there's an education aspect that I think needs to happen. Um, as you said, there's a mindset change that needs to happen. It's very much based on the condition that we've had. Um, there is a trust and respect issue we also need to understand. Um, because if you're giving me the time off when I'm, I'm participating in this pilot, then I need to have those boundaries respected. You can't be texting me when I'm, I'm supposed to be having my time off. So is there a pact or some sort of an agreement yes. that is in place? That's great because you know there's no there's no point in doing it if that's not in place. Um, so yeah, I just think hustle culture, education around what real productivity is and positive productivity, not um, trying to cram more into my day just because I'm taking some hours off. And then this idea of respect and boundaries, that's what I wanted to make sure we understood. Leah, but thank otherwise... you so much for that contribution. Invaluable observations, and we completely agree with you. I think the conversation around productivity is one that is in its infancy in South Africa, certainly within certain mm -hmm. sectors of the economy, and, and one that we feel that we found a safe vehicle through the coalition and through the global framework to approach because we have sort of peer learnings from mm -hmm. global to apply. Um, and, and it's a healthy conversation. It's not meant to be um, a confrontational. It's not meant to create tension. What it is meant to do is create healthy debate. And yeah. the structure of the global framework is very, very clear that it is an opt-in, first of all, 
So it cannot be mandated. Uh, okay. No organization that participates in the pilot can mandate that every person in the in the organization goes on the pilot. That's not the mm -hmm. point of this. That's the first okay. point. The second yeah. is 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 you know it, it's 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 opt-in, and the second point is it's it's um it's it's co-created essentially. Yeah. So so the teams or the individuals and the individuals within the teams or departments etc. have to be the ones that come and table how they propose to make the best use of their time off okay. while remaining true to the productivity measures. And okay. you'll be surprised at putting a little bit of education into time management, meeting management. I mean, if you're looking at the services or knowledge workers, it's astonishing how much time is wasted in Zoom calls, interruptions, overlapped meetings, et cetera. So when some industries you might find if there are high levels of productivity already that that reduction in the working uh, week might produce a slight increase in intensity of work but I guarantee you from a work smart and hard and efficiently that is mm. ultimately what we are wanting to learn to do yeah and that's why yeah. we experiment so we need to find that optimal ways so the staff need to feel safe they need mm. to see the leadership walk the talk and talk the talk they too need to be showing that they are taking that time off in a way that applies and, you know, and it is optimal for the entire team to be able to yeah. do whatever the outputs of that business are um, and directly tracking the bottom line. And I mean, you can apply it to any situation. I mean, one of the, I always joke, one of the departments that I'd most like to get my hands on is the Department of Home Affairs. <laughs> um, on Tuesday. <laughs> and, I, and I think, I, th I think ironically, people are underestimating our capacity to work more efficiently. We mm. have made some rather negative assumptions on what people understand to be productivity. We're assuming people don't talk about it. We're assuming that 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 framework actually doesn't exist in the back of the mind somewhere. And one of the things we haven't done is consulted. We don't mm. ask. There is a, there is a, I'm a leader. I'm going to tell you um, how much time you can take off. Well, I am a leader. And if I don't see you in your, in your chair 24 seven or, you know, five days, five days a week, eight hours a day, you're not working. So go and take your 15 minute tea break and your half an hour lunch break or your hour lunch break. And, mm -hmm. and there, there is the other side of that and that there is a protection of workers' rights from a la labor perspective or a legislative perspective. Yes. And this is another thing that this pilot does. We're, we don't engage with labor law. That's not what we're here to do. There is a pact that is signed between an employer and an employee, and it is a pact that we are going to experiment for a period of six months to see if we can improve not only well-being, culture, engagement, um, make space for more skills development and training, mm. uh, improve well-being metrics, all of those things. But we're going to mm. see that if we as a collective can improve productivity, maintain and improve it, and improve bottom line. And ultimately, mm. if we can get to that economic shift and marker, oh, yeah, it's, it's going to present a very difficult argument for why a five-day week, which is a, almost a century-old concept defined for a manufacturing era, why mm. should it still apply? And you're right. It needs to be safe, unconfrontational, and 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 burnout is a very, very real um, threat and a, a particular threat to, to 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 working moms. And further to that, Leanne, um, and and we'd love to take this discussion further with you. But the the part time and the gig economy, this concept of time off applies to them too. Mm -hmm. So so you know, even if you're if you're contracted to work ten hours a week. Can you produce those outputs efficiently with 80% of that time? And if not, why on earth are you being paid? You know, if you can produce it, why are you being paid less? Because you're working more op optimally. And that is an mm. important to point, departure point. Move away exactly. from the time, focus on the value delivery proposition, exactly. output conversation. Then what is the value of that output? Then we start mm. talking about within which period of time and how we make mm. sure that we get it done. Exactly. No, 100%. Thank Thanks you me. so much, Karen, and great conversation and contribution, Leanne. Thank you for your questions. I just want to open the floor and see if there's any others, um, because I'm conscious of time. And MQ, it looked as if you had something that you wanted to contribute, or any other questions? I'd be happy to go after a question. Um, I can hold that thought for a while. <laughs> We're good on questions. Um, so go to the thought that you want to share 
I was I was going to kind of echo the sentiment that Leanne had kind of brought up and that Karen had spoken to so well, and that we're trying very hard to make sure that there's a Socratic approach to those managers. Um, you know, one of the things that I did before I opened up my mouth in public around the, the benefit of a four-day week is, you know, I what I thought was a, a global shakedown of how long people work. And, um, you know, is there a correlation between riches and time and time inputs? And I mean, so clearly the answer to that is no. But what's interesting is that you can use those things in the Socratic approach and go, well, if the Germans are so rich and they work 25.6 hours on average, what do they do who have all the industries that we have, who have all the companies that we have that we don't do? And all of a sudden that opens up a conversation to um, what are the... Um, approaches that other people can use, what are the approaches that we can learn from elsewhere, and you can do so not just with a particular country or a particular company, but all of these opportunities and all of these learnings about. And so I think that the education is great because you can use the subject matter expertise of that person, you know, paired with this other experience that other people are having, and then you can, you know, send them on a journey where they can more internalize their, their, their learning as opposed to us prescribing it. Like, so, you know, so often happens at business school. So I thought that that was interesting. And I think I like the approach of involving uh, people's thoughts in that way, because I think that it leads to kind of better outcomes. Uh, so I thought that that would be useful maybe to, um, to add to the commentary. Mm, thank you. Thank you, MQ. I think we've got one final question. Zambini, you had some a question that you wanted to ask. We are wrapping up now. No. No questions? I think we're... Sorry, can you guys hear me? We can hear? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm gonna chat. I'm gonna tap the four questions out in the chat box. So I'm not gonna you have to say give me answers now. But there's three areas that I was looking to have a conversation about: our initiative allies that are in corporate. Um, the second is the credentialing of the program via partners like employer of choice um, associations and uh, fast, short, quick, punchy objection handling content um, that gets us over the line. So for those are the sort of three areas uh, and I, I'm going to put it out onto the chat box um, and they can we can engage uh, separately. Great. Super. Thanks, Zambini. Our time here is done in the spirit of productivity. We're a minute two minutes over. So we're going to close on the webinar. Everybody here is going to get the slide deck and a recording because Karen whipped through some amazing content and many people couldn't physically be here, but they're here with us and they're going to be here on the replay. So I really just want to end off with the call to action. Call to action to collaborate, to co-create, call to action to come with us into the future and push the boundaries of what we're currently experiencing within our working world and trying to achieve balance and what potentially could happen. It's we're, we're there's space for everyone here and I'm very excited. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your participation and your involvement. You know where we are. I would love your engagement. I would love to hear from you all and please take up the arm and, and talk with any of us, engage with us further so that we can make the change that we know is important and necessary to make right now. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, MQ. And thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, you, everyone.